What's up everybody, it's ASF. Before we get started with the main video, I want to give a sincere thank you to the following people. Chris Lennon, Juliet Larson, KBiz, special thanks Kosar Bishop, Farah Deba Khan, Courtney Eller, Karina Paz, Jesse Marasco, Tony Green, SF Thomas, Alan Carter, Lynn Cardinal, Melita Ibrahim Begovich, Michael Boyer, Jason Johnson. Thank you guys so much just for being in general really cool people and for supporting the channel. Thank you to all the patrons and members. Hope you enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, I am the American Spy Fox. Welcome to the channel. As you may know, there are certain questions that have long been hotly debated within the rock community and depending on whose side you take would probably depend on the answer. Questions like, did Courtney love cheat on Kurt Cobain? Was Billy Corgan and Courtney Love involved intimately during her marriage to Kurt Cobain or immediately following his death? Why did Billy Corgan take so much crap from Courtney Love throughout the 90s and 2000s? Did Billy Corgan write Hole's second major label record, Celebrity Skin? Again, depending on whose side you're on probably determines your answer but you may be shocked to find out that the definitive answers are already out there for us to find and it's courtney and billy's own words who answer these questions for us what happens back in the 90s is there are a lot of radio interviews newspaper interviews magazine interviews you read those or watch those one time you forget all about it and it's not documented but as these old interviews appear on youtube seemingly out of nowhere sometimes we start to get answers that we never knew was there before thanks to what i would call a hot tip from a viewer who sent me a radio interview with courtney love and two interviews of billy corgan with howard stern in 98 that were just posted to youtube a few days ago we found out a lot I can comfortably say that I can answer these questions for you today without leaving any room for doubt and the mystery surrounding these questions can be laid to rest. Now, if you want the answers, it's gonna take some time. You're gonna to have to follow along with me and listen to several different clips. I will interject in between to fill in the gaps. Let us start at the beginning. Billy Corgan explaining to Howard Stern how he met Courtney Love. How did she get to be every cool guy's girlfriend? How social, social assimilation. <laughs> How did that work out? Did he I will say to her credit, she could pick him from across the room. She knew talent. Oh, she, she went, that one, that one. So she saw you playing in a club and kind of... No, actually, I, I'm responsible. I found her. Where did you find her? <laughs> Such a messed up story. <laughs> I, I was, on a, was on a record label, and they, they sent a box of you know music. Right. And uh, one of the singles was her new single. And I flipped over the record, and I looked at her on the back, and I said, I need to meet this woman. Wow. Wow. Never heard of her, never heard her name. I just looked at the picture and I said, I need to meet that woman. I called the person at the record company and said, I need to meet this you woman. Mean, was it was a physical look or um, was it also you heard the music and thought that she? No, it was even before I heard the music. I right. saw her picture and I said, I need to meet this woman. It was like Kind of like, uh, hey, I feel like that's my soulmate kind of thing. Or I feel I a connection. I think you could put it in those terms. Right. I mean, that, that may, most people wouldn't understand that. I looked at the picture and I said, I need to meet that person. And when you need to meet that person, who, who do you go to make to arrange all that? Well, in the case of the Courtney, I called the woman at the record label and I said, da 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 and I kind of arranged for her to stay at my apartment when they came through town with the right. band and da, da, da. and that started this whole <laughs> insanity. Hmm, sound familiar? Seems Billy Corgan and friend Marilyn Manson had a habit of using their status to just reach out and bring women to them. Who's this woman at the record company that Billy's talking about that he contacted and arranged for Courtney to stay at his apartment? Janet Billig. Janet Billig at this time works for Caroline Records. She would become Hole's manager. She would even be hired by Gold Mountain, Dan Goldberg's company who managed Nirvana at the request of Kurt Cobain, suggested by Courtney Love. And uh, just getting back to this idea that Courtney Love knows how to, 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 to look at a guy and go, hey, that's 
that's my guy. Oh. Were you shocked when she hooked up with uh, Kurt Cobain? Not really. I saw that coming. You did. Do yeah. you think that? I that... mean, look again. She, <laughs> she picked the bigger fish. One has to wonder if Courtney Love even possesses the ability to genuinely love another person. We've heard it time and time again, including from best friend Cap Jelen, best friend and lover Billy Corgan. Courtney goes after the big fish. She doesn't care who it is. As long as they're on top, that's who she's going for. It's kind of sad if you really think about it. Courtney hid behind the guise of feminism, but it almost seems as though she judges her own self-worth through what man she's with. And if she's with the man that's on top, then she feels better about herself, which was the opposite of the woman empowerment movement. Even in the Kurt Loder Madonna MTV interview that Courtney Love interrupted, she said if she wanted to be a surgeon, she'd have to own the hospital and therefore she'd have to date the top surgeon? Why do you need to date the top surgeon to own the hospital? She does not practice what she preaches. Everything she does, everything she says, tells young women that they need to get a powerful man to get to where they want to be. And that's just not true in this day and age. I digress. Getting back on subject, Howard starts to probe Billy on the possibility of being jealous that Kurt Cobain has taken his woman from him. Not only taken his woman, but he's also a better musician. Now that I look back, I mean, the guy's catalog's unbelievable. So would you run out when those albums were new, when Nirvana would put out an album, would you run out, buy the <laughs> album, take it home? You didn't have to. They were everywhere. Right. You but know, Everywhere but, you went, you're like, oh, God, I got to hear this. And yeah. you'd hear that, and it would actually depress you, probably. Because, probably, yeah. yeah. Because you say, shit. <laughs> well, he was, I, also, he, you know, he was also living with my ex-girlfriend. For those who may not know, may not be Smashing Pumpkin fans, Smashing Pumpkins was signed to Caroline Records, just like Hole. And in May of 91, they released an album called Gish. Gish sold 400,000 copies. At the time, this is an astronomical number. No other underground band signed to an independent label had sold so many records. Billy Corgan was king of the underground, but his reign is very short-lived. Only four months after Gish is released to critical acclaim, a little-known band by the name of Nirvana comes out with Nevermind, sells millions of copies, and makes Billy Corgan's accomplishment seem like child's play. His crown is quickly stolen by Kurt Cobain and his lady. Although he's able to laugh about it much later, we know that during the 90s, he had to have been terribly, terribly jealous at least while Kurt was still alive. Fast forward a few years and Billy gets his woman back and she needs him just like she needed Kurt Cobain. So you worked with uh, Courtney Love, right? Oh, oh yeah. yeah, that's a whole thing. Now th this is fascinating. <laughs> that's speaking of whole. So Courtney Love, so now here she's waiting around to do her second album and all this. So she gets in touch with you, right? We were uh, boyfriend, girlfriend around 91. Right, and everyone was accusing you of having an affair with her when Kurt Cobain was alive, right? Yeah, that was not true. That's not true at all. Right, so after he died, you became her lover. No. When asked if he was having an affair with Courtney while Kurt was alive, he immediately says no. When asked if he was her lover after he died, he hesitates. Mm, no. Did that seem very convincing to you guys? Didn't seem very convincing to me. And later in another radio interview, Billy will let it slip that he was in fact her lover after Kurt's death, stay with me, and know that this does not let Courtney off the hook for having an affair while she was with Kurt. Let's switch over to Courtney real quick. Although the least damning evidence I found to prove that Courtney and Billy were having an affair immediately following Kurt's death, this is only the first piece of evidence I found. Um, and they're not all about me. One's about me and Trent and how mad he was about that. But, um, and that one's called, I think it's called Where Boys Fear to Tread. During a radio interview, Courtney starts listing off Smashing Pumpkin songs that she claims Billy Corgan wrote about her. One of those songs, Where Boys Fear to Tread, released on Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness in 1995, one year after Kurt's death, well, Courtney tells us it was a song written out of jealousy and anger over Trent Reznor. According to Courtney herself, she claims her and Trent Reznor had a fling following Kurt's death in 1994. In fact, Hole was touring with Marilyn Manson and Nine Inch Nails in 1994. Who was the headlining band? The Big Cheese? Trent Reznor's Nine Inch Nails. What did Billy say Courtney does? She goes after the big fish. 
So this has not only happened to Billy once, it's now happening to him all over again. He gets so angry about it, he writes a song about Trent Reznor. Within the song, calling Trent Reznor King of the Horseflies, Dark Prince of Death, and referring to Courtney Love as my baby, my sweet thing. Yuck. Now, it is worth mentioning that to this day, Trent Reznor denies ever having any kind of fling with Courtney Love, saying that she made it up, which it could easily be argued, well, maybe Billy wasn't intimate with her. Maybe Billy wanted to be with her, but she shunned him to go after Trent Reznor. Well, you know me. There's more to this story than just this. Keep watching. Okay, so you went ahead, though, but you ended up writing the majority of the songs. True or false? They brought me in just to kind of help go through the material that they had and kind of just straighten it out. Was it as brilliant as that first album's material, or was it just all over the place and horrible? I thought it had a ton of potential, but was no way in hell was it going to come together. At first, Billy is kind of elusive. He says, uh, I was kind of there as a producer. They had lyrics, they had riffs, they had ideas, but they needed someone to come in and take all of these things and put them together. You know, execute them, arrange them into actual songs. Howard, being the great listener he is and the great interviewer he is, understands that Billy is just being nice. Instead of saying they weren't a functioning band, they were all on drugs, they didn't have shit, and they needed someone like me to put it together for them, Billy says it in a nice way. Well, they just needed some help. Howard probes him and says, well, their first record was great. If they did that all on their own, why can't they do another one? all on their own. Why do they need you? He probes him about Live Through This. So are you one of those people that believes that her first album was, in fact, written by Kurt Cobain? No. You do not think no. so? But he might have gone through it and fixed it, huh? Uh, that's possible. I don't know. I don't have anything that I know about that, but I can say that at that time they were much more of a functioning band. I mean, right. you're a functioning band. It's much easier if you have a, an idea, you know, to come in and you just kind of play, practice, and the song works out. Right. Whereas they weren't really a functioning band at this point, so they just had some kind of riffs and jams. And right. There was no congeal, uh, you know, that nothing was going to come together. Billy tells us, in his opinion, Kurt didn't write the record. In the same breath, admits that he doesn't know. He wasn't there. He wasn't around at this time. There was another man that Courtney was fooling around with, and we'll get to him, but at this point in time, Billy is not messing around with Courtney Love. Now, we know that Kurt was in the studio at least on two separate occasions. We know that he sung backup vocals on Live Through This. We also know that Kristen Pfaff was a fucking genius. Whether you knew this or not, Kristen Pfaff was the leader of Janitor Joe. She was the creative driving force. She wrote most of the songs. She made most of the decisions. We also know, if you watch my channel, we also know that Kurt and Kristen were becoming very close friends, and they spent a lot of time talking to each other on the phone, even during the Atlanta recording of Live Through This, when Kurt wasn't in the studio. We know this because of her brother Jason's recollections. I personally believe that Live Through This was a collaboration between Kurt and Kristen. Kristen was bouncing ideas off of Kurt, Kurt was giving his feedback, Kristen was suggesting them to the producer. We know that Courtney became irate at Kristen during the recording studio session for suggesting all these arrangements because the producer was agreeing with Kristen and not agreeing with Courtney, which fueled Courtney's anger. And the famous quote, you tell me how to sing, you eyeball my husband, comes from those recording sessions. If I'm going to give anybody credit for Live Through This, I'm going to give it to Kristen Pfaff. As far as the lyrics go on Live Through This, I would attribute those to Courtney. Courtney thought that her lyrics were the best thing that ever happened to poetry. Her ego would not have allowed someone else to put their lyrics in those songs. But that's the only thing I would attribute to Courtney. I believe Kurt Cobain and Kristen were working behind the scenes to secretly help Courtney, and Courtney's ego wouldn't allow her to see that these songs were coming together because of Kurt and Kristen. Nothing to do with her. Again, I digress. No matter what you think about Howard Stern, whether you like him or not, you cannot deny that he is very good at getting answers out of people. He continues to probe Billy until Billy finally cracks and tells everybody what we pretty much already knew. So you so you sat down and, and what is it? Some kind of controversy now. You're saying that you wrote most of the new album for Courtney Love and she's saying, no, you didn't have anything to do with it. What is going on? I don't understand no, the controversy. It's, it's really simple. I came in and they, they were very concerned. Okay, we don't want you to write. Right. I said, no problem. I'm just here to help cool. as a friend. Right. Well, I don't so, think which, it was 
There's so so I'm much that you had, you're claiming that you wrote everything. You, I think the quote that probably got her upset was that there wouldn't have been a new whole album if it hadn't been no, for you. No, there wouldn't. There wouldn't be. Right. Corgan finally stops beating around the bush and just says, look, there wouldn't even be a record if it wasn't for me. And in fact, in a radio interview, Courtney admits, one of the only times I've ever heard her admit this, that she doesn't even really know how to execute a song. You have flair though. You have a sound. I have a sound. <laughs> it, it's it's not what it was, but uh, I can write a song. I just can't execute it so well. The DJ, sarcastically laughing, says, yeah, you have a sound. And to my shocking surprise, Courtney doesn't get mad. She agrees. She laughs about it too. She's saying, I don't have much of any musicianship. So exactly what was Billy Corgan's contribution to Hole's celebrity scam. So yeah, you probably wrote most of the album. That's what I'm well, getting from out this. Well, out of the maybe the 15 songs that we worked on at the time, I think I'd help write maybe six or seven. There's demos, there's EPs, extended plays, and then there's LPs, long plays, full length records. What Billy is saying is once I helped them put their material together, they realized they did not have enough songs for a full length album. So I said, why don't I write some songs for you? How many? Six or seven. That's your answer. Billy Corgan wrote half of Celebrity Skin. Courtney comes on Howard Stern right after Billy, only wants to give him credit for the one song, which was the biggest hit. He wrote some of the songs on the album and you don't want to give him credit. He wrote the... Da -da, da -da, da -da. Some might say, so what? It's Billy's problem. He should have had a contract. He should have had proof that he did this. And it makes you wonder, someone commented recently, and this thought never crossed my mind until I read this comment, what does Courtney have on Billy Corgan that makes him want to kiss her ass so much? You have to remember, in 1998, the Smashing Pumpkins are on a decline. They haven't had any hits since 95 with Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness. As the Smashing Pumpkins' reputation and popularity Popularity decline, Billy's writing hit songs for Courtney Love. Why doesn't he keep those hit songs for himself? He's ruining his own band as he propels another band. And this is what he has to say about that. He's so egotistical, he won't even take blame. Now, I've been reading that you're disappointed in this, uh, the reception to your latest album? I'm disappointed in our fans, mostly. Really? Why? Because I think the fans are kind of going through the, it's kind of the, they're sad that grunge has ended. Right. And so they're going to punish the pumpkins because, you know, nobody wants to rock anymore. But let's face it, I mean, kids right now just aren't inter that interested in rock and roll. Okay, I can speak on this because I was, in 1998, I was a sophomore in high school at the peak of my teenage angst kids were very interested in rock and roll the smashing pumpkins were losing popularity because instead of rocking and playing the music that made them popular they started experimenting with this weird electronica bullshit that no one cared about billy cannot accept that something he created was rejected by his fans he thinks there's something wrong with them not something wrong with him billy took a chance with his band he believed that music was headed in this new direction when actually it wasn't not even sure what you would call it sort of a electronica love rock and he was wrong it took many many years for Billy to finally admit that he was wrong and he did so on Joe Rogan some bands take a chance with new experimental stuff and they win big like Nirvana's in utero some bands like the Smashing Pumpkins take a chance and they lose all respect so as an artist I'm trying to let Let's move it on into something else. Keep doing something different. Yeah, and I, I feel like the fans don't really have our back on this album. And ultimately, you know, the general public in the world, they're going to buy an album if they like the songs and they, you know, something connects with them. And we could have we could have done a whole album of rock songs. It's right. Not, it's not a problem, but it's not where music's going to be headed. So should we be the Smashing Pumpkins who have been ahead of their time, or should we just kind of do what other bands do, which is keep rehashing the same thing just until to, everyone gets sick of them? Yeah, and yeah. keep milking your money. You know? I understand what Billy's saying. He's trying to be progressive, but he just can't admit that the direction he thought music was going was wrong. He was wrong. He should have just kept on a rockin'. Who knows? Maybe Billy thought he could turn the Smashing Pumpkins into Coldplay or something. Billy says that they're gonna be the Smashing Pumpkins ahead of their time. Well, whatever he was seeing in the future, the fans weren't buying it. He 
answers his own questions, why are we doing so poorly, within his own dialogue. No one connected with their new music, because it wasn't the kind of music that we wanted. Fans don't have tons of money to go blow on records to support a band just to help them through the bad times. A person like me who has patrons and members, I can make a couple shitty videos and my patrons and members are going to be like, okay, he's not going to hit a home run every video. Not every video is going to be, um, you know, great. They understand that. But rock fans, they're not going to buy your record unless they connect with it emotionally. They're not going to pay you money in the hopes that the next record will be better. And my god, I can't believe I'm about to say this. I actually agree with what Courtney Love is about to tell you. It's about sound over technicality then. No, because Corgan is one of the greatest bass players, actually. He's a better bass player, I think, than he is a guitar player. He's a hell of a guitar player. Yeah, he's, he's a hell of a guitar player, but he just can't seem to get over the lump and, like, become relevant again. It's really weird. He's doing all sorts of wacky doodle things to do that, and it just doesn't seem to really work for him. Remember what Corgan said at the very beginning, Courtney knows how to pick him, and she's telling you straight up, this ain't working for you. Corgan better go back to the original formula. Courtney knows talent. She spent her entire life seeking it out and finding new ways to exploit it. It's also worth mentioning that she is bad mouthing Billy at the same time he wrote her hit songs and his band is doing terrible. She's bad mouthing him. What nerve. This dude wrote you hit songs, made you millions of dollars for free as a friend and then you're gonna go on the radio and bad mouth his band because they're terrible terrible sound? My god, what kind of person does this? Is there a pumpkin tune that you have a particular fondness for? Yeah, because there's so many of them that are about me. <laughs> Pick one about you. Um, most of the time his dream is about me. No, I think I put it on, there's a song called um, Bodies. And then there's that's on that's a melancholy. And then there's today. And there's Is that about you? yeah, that's nice. Tonight, tonight. There's you're just reeling off a list of like amazing Smashing Pumpkins songs, aren't you? Really? I know. And then he stopped <laughs> writing about me, and then he stopped having hits. I don't know what that's about. Great line she had recently was uh, Billy stopped writing hits when he start stopped writing about me. And of course, my retort was, and you stopped having hits when I stopped writing yours. <laughs> <laughs> Are you guys friends now? I mean, because Courtney made up with Dave Grohl. Would you ever have predicted that? Uh, knowing what she thinks about Dave Grohl, no. Uh, it, that is so strange. Because I've heard the pillow talk, you know what I mean? Right. You've had all the pillow talk. Yeah. Whoa. Hold up. Pillow talk about Dave Grohl. Well, this is strange. Courtney didn't even know Dave Grohl until she got involved with Kurt Cobain and Nirvana. And Courtney loved Dave girl in the beginning i mean after all who's standing right in between kurt and courtney at their wedding who is the best man courtney during the times of nirvana even said that there were times kurt would get into a depression a funk and dave was the only one who could bring him out of it dave was the fun goofy guy who could make kurt go from being depressed to in a good mood courtney relied on dave for those times kurt got into those depressive funks courtney did not find an enemy in dave until after kurt cobain's death when they started fighting over the publishing rights and royalties. Who's going to own Nirvana? If Billy was not Courtney's lover after Kurt's death, what are they doing having pillow talk about how much Courtney disdains Dave Grohl? Think about it. Billy loves to do interviews and he loves to hear himself talk. He will ramble in circles until you're not sure if he's crazy or a genius. But he never has a clear point. In this case, he let the cat out of the bag. They were lovers after Kurt died. Hallelujah. God bless America and God bless Howard Stern. And doesn't it make you wonder why they wanted to hide it? Kurt was gone after all. And let me just add real quick, if you're looking for advice on music, probably not best to get it from Billy Corgan. Remember, he bet big on the future of music with his own band and they lost. If you want to know the future of independent music, watch a Steve Albini interview, not a Billy Corgan interview. With number two, we come back to the question, why does Billy take so much shit from Courtney? Why does he do so much? 
much for her. Well, it seems to me that Courtney was his muse, that he only wrote those smashing pumpkins hits because of Courtney. If she's telling the truth and all those songs are really about her, maybe Billy feels as though he owes her. He seems to have some kind of obsession with her, even a codependency that enables him to write great music. And when he is without her, he's stagnant and he can't seem to write great music. Remember that this is a man who simply saw her picture, didn't know her name, had never heard her voice, never listened to her music, and he was so drawn to her that he went out of his way to meet her. There is some kind of weird connection between Billy Corgan and Courtney Love that cannot be explained. And I fear that it's actually a one-way connection. Billy feels connected to Courtney. Courtney takes advantage of his creativity and musicianship. Not everything on Melancholy is about me. There's another girl started coming around and he started writing about her. But it's a mix. The Siamese Dream is pretty much, there's one song called Space Boy about his brother. The rest are pretty much about me. You're listening to The First Time with me, Matt Everett, and that was Today by The Smashing Pumpkins, a song written about my guest this week, Courtney Love. I'm Matt Everett, this is Six Music, and this is The First Time. This is the show where we look at the key first moments in an artist's career. The only reason I played that is I found it funny and ironic that Courtney Love is being interviewed as a rock star on this radio station. They play a song that was written by Billy Corgan about Courtney Love, and then they play her song, which was written by Billy Corgan. But Courtney's the rock star. She's a succubus. She did nothing to get to where she is. And again, we have to ask ourselves, why does Billy go out of his way to do these things for her? Personally, I think it's because second place sucks. Billy was the golden child until Kurt Cobain came along and stole his crown. He wanted to reclaim the crown and he wanted to say, see, she depended on Kurt and now she depends on me. I'm the reigning king. I think it was jealousy that fueled his ambition to help Courtney Love. He had something to prove in the rock world. I'm Kurt Cobain now. Do you find yourself jealous of other musicians who achieve that kind of success? Because, I mean, you've got your own success and you're huge and you're gonna go down to musical history. Uh, but do you, do you find yourself and you just go, fuck. Why is it happening to him? Only, yeah. only time I feel jealousy is when I think somebody's great. If that makes, does that make sense? Absolutely. You know, if somebody's they're great and I'm like, man, I wish I'd written that song or man, I wish I'd done that. Yeah. How did she get to be every cool guy's girlfriend? Do you really think I'm gonna end this video without talking about Evan Dando? I got one thing for you that proves Courtney Love was cheating on Kurt Cobain with Evan Dando. What is it, Baba Booey? You, you know, I don't want to revisit old stuff, but I just want to talk about that Evan Baba Dando Bowie. stuff. Yeah. Baba you know, Evan Bowie. Dando said in an interview that uh, Smashing Pumpkins are a crap band and they deserve to have all the problems that happened to him. Right. And when he a when they asked him how people should remember him, he said, I'd like to re be remembered as someone who really dislikes Bill Billy Corgan intensely. See? What That's what I was talking that? about. Why is that? I think he's mad because we threw him out of a dressing room. I also, wait, wait, Excuse I, me, also, he sucks. What good songs has he done? done? Mrs. Robinson. I have to agree with Howard here. I have never understood why people call Evan Dando a rock star. His only good song was a cover of Simon and Garfunkel's Mrs. Robinson. Yeah, Evan, I mean, yeah. That. Evan, Evan has a lot of problems. Is it's that a right? A lot of problems, yeah, a lot. Wow. And, and what's he, his problem with you? He's jealous, because you're a genius. I've known Evan for 10 years, and you know, I, I sat backstage with him in Madison Square Garden before we played, and he was literally in tears talking about the old days and how wow. he wishes things were simple again. And then, you know, an hour later, he's throwing food at people backstage and screaming at them, telling them to get the hell out of there. And so we had to throw him out. So anything that he says... So I haven't seen him since. So, oh, so, so he's so, mad. Yeah. Right. Uh, hey, you know, whatever. I, I don't care what he thinks of me. I just, you know, he's in bad shape. So it's not my fault. You know? I love the world of rock and roll. <laughs> Oh, that's so great. It never stops. It never stops. No. And Evan was the guy they rumored to be with Courtney Love while Kurt Cobain was alive, right? That's the guy. Right? Can't can't divulge any information on that one. Uh -oh. You ought to write a book. <laughs> <laughs> you ought to write a yeah, I could write a pretty good book. Yeah, he huh? obviously knows something. You got to open up a little. <laughs> I got to tell you some of this stuff off the air. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs>